Howdy from Arlington, Texas, y'all. I hope this video finds you healthy and well, and that you're smart enough to wear a mask when you go out in public in these crazy, crazy times. So, you've seen it's a showcase Sunday video for me. What you see in front of you, other than my beautiful face, are the career statistics of the subject of today's showcase, Herb Score. I'm sure that there's more of you out there that know who he is than I probably give credit for, but there's a lot of you that don't, and I'm always fascinated on why people collect what they collect. Um, you know, hopefully there's a reason that's more than money, because you know, honestly, the whole money thing is just starting to drive me bonkers. So anyway, you see some career statistics in front of you. Why do I have a small, and I will say while I'm thinking about it, these are not all the cards I have of him. I am in a organizing phase right now, but I still have things scattered everywhere. So there's a few more things that I'm missing, including, I believe, at least two autographs. Um, and someday, you know, I'll get it all together and we'll get an updated showcase. But anyway, why do I collect or, you know, what is my connection to a pitcher that had a 55 and 46 career record with a 336 ERA, which is not, I guess it's not horrible by a lot of standards, but it's nothing, nothing to, you know, it's nothing, nothing great. 837 strikeouts and 858 innings pitched. Eh, almost a strikeout an inning. Not bad. But why do I collect this guy? Why do I have an attachment to Herb score? So picture it. Morgantown, West Virginia. Christmas morning. I don't know, 1991 or 1992. I can't remember which year it was. It was either when I was in 7th or 8th grade. So one thing my parents always did is I started to get a little older. I say me, but we, my sister and I. They started to buy us a big birthday present every year that was kind of a thing that was, uh, you know, it, it was an in preparation for, you know, at some point you're going to be moving out and you're going to need to take things with you. Well, I got a full stereo. And I mean, at that time it was the, you know, it had a five disc changer. That was the first CD player I had. Oh, I was a happy kid. Had a turntable on the top. I still have this actually. It is not hooked up, but I actually still have this. It, uh, moved from Morgantown, West Virginia to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Indianapolis, Indiana, and now to Arlington, Texas with me. So they were right. It was something that I was going to have for a while, but we hooked up just a little antenna to it, and all of a sudden, on the AM dial, I could get all of these stations, like far away stations. My sports world opened up because I grew up, I didn't have cable. So when I watched sports, it was NBC, CBS, ABC, you know, what I could see. And, you know, I'd spend some summers in Birmingham. I'd spend a few weeks with my grandmother, my aunts, my uncles, and so I would get some ESPN then, or when my grandma would come up in the summers and visit, visit, she always stayed in a hotel and would always have ESPN, so I'd spend a night or two there watching ESPN. But this big world got opened up to me, and I was getting, I could get, and most of these had to be after about 5 o'clock at night, but I could get KMOX out of St. Louis. I could occasionally get a station out of Atlanta that would play the Braves games. I could get, every once in a while, I could get, there was a station that played one of the New York teams. I can't remember which station it was. I could get up to Toronto sometimes. I could get Raptors games, believe it or not. But what changed things for me was I could get WKNR AM 1220 out of Cleveland after about 5 o'clock in the evenings. And up to that point, you know, we're talking I'm 12, 13. I was a kid. I was a front runner. Man, when I first started, I was a Braves fan because of Dale Murphy. And then I, Will Clark was my favorite player. So I was a Giants fan. Then I was an A's fan because the Bra the Bash brothers were cool. I liked a lot of teams. But I took to the Cleveland teams. 
the Browns, the Indians. Yes, the Cavs actually did exist before LeBron James got there. I'm not sure that people know that, but they did exist, and they were my team back in the day. But it was the Indians, man, because, you know, by the time, you know, it was 5 o'clock, 5, 6 o'clock, you know, it was the pregame show. The Indians were coming on. So I spent so many spring, summer, and even fall nights just listening to Indians game while I played with my baseball cards. Uh, You know, if they were on the West Coast, I had a bedtime until I was almost a high school senior that was 9 o'clock. So I just lay in bed and listen to the Indians. Um, And then in the winters, it would be the Chicago Blackhawks from WMVP in Chicago. But that's another story for another day. So Herb Score was one of the two Indians announcers. Tom Hamilton was also with him. Uh, They would alternate kind of the play-by-play and the color aspect of it. It's kind of hard to describe for me what they did. But, you know, I grew up listening to sports more than I watched sports. And it be, it actually influenced my life. And, you know, you think about your life and any decision you make that you could have made differently could have set you somewhere else and you may not be there. So I don't regret this, but I wanted to be a radio broadcaster. I wanted to go into sports radio because of this. And I went to the West Virginia University and I graduated with a TV and radio broadcasting degree, which I have never used. Never. But anyway, so, you know, it's all these little, these little things. And that's why, you know, my drawn to listening to Herb Score and Tom Hamilton is what put me where I am. So anyway, what you see right there is his career statistics. So yeah, I I collected some of his cards. I had some of them even as a kid. I would buy, you know, some vintage, some cheap ones. Um, at some point, I probably got, I know I got rid of them in one of my dozens of card purges that I made over the years. But, we'll show them, but I want to talk about something else that you may or may not know. If you don't know who he is, you don't know this story. If you know who he is, you probably know this. But let's take a quick look at Herbert Jude Scores' first two seasons. Okay, so you see these numbers? Nothing, nothing noteworthy, nothing impressive. There's his first two seasons in the majors. 1955 as an age is a rookie at his age 22 season. 16 and 10 with a 285 ERA, 245 strikeouts and 207 innings pitched. He won the American League Rookie of the Year, and he was an All Star. In his age 23 season, the next season. 20 and 9, 253 ERA, 263 strikeouts, 249 innings pitched, and another All Star appearance. So there's that. There's this. What happened? What happened was that, unfortunately, uh, on the on the morning of May 7th, 1957, Herb Score felt well enough to go out and take the mound against the New York Yankees, and in that game, he took a line drive from Gil McDougal back in the face. And his career, essentially, his playing career, essentially, was over. He was able to come back and pitch a little bit. Um, He pitched a couple more seasons, I think, uh, I don't think he pitched again that year. I believe it was the next season. He came back in, you know, a few seasons for Cleveland, and then he was traded in uh, 1960. He was traded to the White Sox, but he never fully recovered from it. His vision came back fine, but what happened was after the shot to his face, he changed his delivery his wind-up delivery, I don't know what part of it exactly, but he changed something, and it affected his pitching. You know, I I don't recall for sure if it's that his velocity decreased or what it was, um, but he was just never the same. So, I know that 
over at Eddie's Autographs channel, I'll try to remember to put a link below, he's talking about inspirational stories relating to cards for a, uh, you know, video. So this is kind of a video response to him. I don't know if he'll count it or not because I'm not going to put it in the title. But even though his playing career was over, um, he spent, he retired in 1962 and he spent 34 years as a Cleveland Indians announcer. He was on TV from 1964 to 67 and radio from 1968 until 1997. His, uh, his final game was Game 7 of the 97 World Series, which the Indians, unfortunately, did not win. Um, in 1998, he was in a car wreck that I recall you know, hearing about that. And, and I, I don't think that uh, he was... I think a lot of people did not expect him to live, uh, myself included. But, you know, I, was, uh, I wasn't even uh, 20 years old then, so, you know, I wasn't as wise as I am now. Uh, but he recovered fully from that, and on opening day, that was in October 98, and on opening day 99, he threw out the first pitch or the opening day for the Indians. I don't recall if it's actually opening day was in Cleveland or not. Probably not. But he threw out the first pitch. Um, in 2002, he had a stroke, and in 2008, he um, did pass away. But So, I collect his cards. I had some back in the day. I have more now. Um, this isn't all of them, but we're going to go to one more thing, as you've seen in the title. For the, uh, what was I calling it? The uh, My unpopular opinion. He may have been better than Sandy Koufax. Now, I, am, I do not understand the, I, I don't know, I don't get it. I, you know, you hear that Koufax was one of the greatest pitchers ever, and he may be, but... He was really good for a very small amount of time, retired young. So I guess I don't quite understand it, but it is what it is, and, you know, we can we can move on. But, well, we can just agree to disagree, I guess. My question is, if you look at Sandy Colfax's career, specifically his early career, he was not good. He wasn't dominant, and he wasn't even really that good early on. So let's look at... Let's put that back up there. In uh, Koufax was three years younger, and he also debuted in 1955. Uh, so, and he was 19. So, I'm not going to compare those seasons. What I will compare is the age 22 season and the age 23 seasons, of which Koufax already had more major league experience. In Koufax's age 22 season, he was 11 and 11 with a 4.48 ERA. 131 strikeouts and 158 innings pitched. In his age 23 season, he was. Did I write that down right? Maybe eight and six. I have eight six eighty six written down, so I'm guessing that was eight and six. With a 405 ERA, 173 strikeouts, and 153 innings pitched. So he did get over the one strikeout an inning hurdle at that point. He wasn't even an all-star until he was 25. Herb Score did not have necessarily the same opportunity he had to dominate from his age 25 through age 30 seasons, which is when uh, Sandy Koufax retired, I believe. So, you take it for what it's worth. I don't know the backstory. I don't know why Koufax wasn't this dominant pitcher early on. Um, but, man, you know, at that point, Herb Score, you know, lefty, Big wind-up, very similar in a lot of ways. And Herb score much earlier, had significant success. So it is what it is. I know Koufax is loved, and I know some people may not agree with me and may vehemently disagree with me. But it is what it is. I have talked for almost 15 minutes. Let me show you some dang cards if you're even still watching. So, 1956 tops. Herb Scores rookie card. As you can kind of see there, he does have that. Oh, man, I got that stupid light on my camera. Let's get it fixed. Boom. There we go. All right. So, yeah, you can kind of see the big, you know, the bigger uh, long stride, things like that. So, I have a few copies of this card. When I pick, when I can find them cheaply, I pick them up. Probably most of these I probably picked up at five bucks or less, I would say. I'm not really going to go more than that. Um, but... 
you know, when I can get a cheap copy of it, I'm going to pick up a Herb Score rookie card every time. I believe, I looked at these right before I did this, I believe these were all gray backs except for one. I believe that might be a white back, and it's just faded out a little or stained or something like that. But uh, his card has both a gray and a white back. And sometimes P and PSA even notes that, because as you can see, I have a PSA 5 copy of his rookie that I did get for, I think I got it for less than 10 bucks. I'm pretty sure I worked it in a deal at a local card show. But this one does say gray back. So those are my Herb Score rookies. We've got a 1958 All-Star. I think that this All-Star set is maybe the best All-Star subset ever. The man on just every card in that set was just gorgeous. And at least that I have in this little group, that's the only copy of the card that I have. I may have more of those. I would like to say I probably do. And I would definitely buy them for a buck or two anytime I see them. But, you know, you sometimes you have to dig through them to get that. So you got a 1959 tops, Low grade. I'm not worried about, you know, trying to have high grade or anything like that. I'm a collector. It's for fun. It's for memories. I'm not worried about all that nonsense. 1960, which this would be his final playing era Indians card. And this was obviously after, after the incident. As I had mentioned, he got traded to the White Sox. So you've got a score 1961 tops. And he's also on a 61 tops uh, multiplayer card with manager Al Lopez, I believe, and early win. You know, obviously the White Sox were hoping he was going to be able to regain that form, but uh, it didn't happen. So I actually showed this a few months ago because this was an awesome purchase. I'd been looking for this card. It came up on eBay, and it, they would take offers. And then lo and behold, it was a card shop that's about 25 minutes north of my office. So I went up one day, I can't remember if I went up on lunch after work, what I did, but I went up and talked to them, and they were consigning it for someone, and I got this, so this is a 1961 Union Oil, Union Oil San Diego Padres card. San Diego Padres were a minor league affiliate for the White Sox at that time. So my focus is a lot better in this video, so maybe I just need to get rid of the backgrounds that I've been doing, the card background. Uh, next year, 1962, uh, this would be his final playing era, player era card. He has been in a few things um, since. He's been in some greats of the game. He's been in a T TCMA. He's been in some of those swell sets. So this is not a certified autograph. But this is an autograph from, I want to say, 2000. Yes, 2000. Fleer, what were these? Greats of the game. And how you know it's not a certified, or it's not the pack pulled autograph is because this is. This is what it actually looks like. It doesn't say of the Cleveland Indians or anything like that. There are two versions of this card. Uh, there is an AL Rookie of the Year 1955 inscription, which is shorter printed. I've put off buying it, and I regret that tremendously because it is going to cost me a pretty penny to buy unless I can happen to luck into catching an auction of one. So I'd like to get a copy of that, you know, have two of them. This one is not certified. This was from, this was Topps Heritage, uh, Herb Score Breaks, Grover Alexander's Rookie Strikeout record with 245 so this was 2004 heritage as you can see right there if it would focus boom there you go so not certified but i think i got this delivered for five bucks or less the uh, the autograph looks legitimate compared to some of the other ones i've seen so for five bucks it was worth it to me and the final one i'm going to show you and this is actually something i've wanted to start working on is i want to get his player air cards slabbed and authenticated. Not a good signature here. Ballpoint pen, you know, not very, uh, not very pretty. I actually had an incident with this, and they sent me the wrong card, um, and didn't send me the stuff to send back the other card. So I still have the card they sent me incorrectly, but I don't know where it is. 
So someday I will find that, and when we do an update on the Herb Score collection, you will see it. But yeah, I want to get all of his player era Indians cards signed. Um, they're not exactly the easiest thing to find, even though he was a uh, not that are already certified. Even though he was a pretty uh, he was a pretty good signer, um, you know, throughout his life. But that's what I got, man. I'm sorry. I didn't get out of here in any kind of good time. It's been over 20 minutes, but I will just wrap it up, and I hope everyone has a great Sunday. I hope you enjoy uh, your Jordan documentary tonight if you're watching it. Um, I will be. But anyway, no matter what you're doing, I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Happy collecting, y'all, and I will see you down the road.